Our Father, the psalmist said, Come, let us bow down and worship the Lord God, our Maker. How grateful we are that we did not evolve out of something. Uh, that's kind of the, uh, the standard party line these days. But all through the scriptures, you are our creator. You are our maker. And we are your people and the sheep of your pasture. Uh, you created us. You gave us life. And then you lead us through life. You sustain us through life. You uh, provide for us. Uh, you keep us. You uphold all things by the word of your power. You sustain us. You give us life and breath and health. In, in you we live and move and exist. You have enclosed us behind and before. Um, you never leave us. You never forsake us. There is nowhere we can go where you are not present. There are times when uh, we walk through dark periods of life and we're confused and we are baffled and we are um, angry and frustrated because we can't see our way out. But we are grateful that you are creator. You are uh, uh, of such magnificence that you are never, ever in the dark. Because darkness and light are alike to thee. So your eye never leaves us. And even when we are confused and baffled and unsure and uh, wounded and... Um, even on the verge of despair, and our spirits are overwhelmed. The psalmist said, when my spirit was overwhelmed, you knew my path. Because you've charted out a, a plan for us, and you've charted out a path. You've given us a certain number of days and a certain number of breaths. And, and at a certain point, you brought us to faith in Christ. We didn't seek you. You sought us. We love you because you first loved us. We were dead in our trespasses and sins and you made us alive in Christ. And now we're following the shepherd. This is, uh, as we've been discussing, Lord, this is a, um, <laughs> th this is a long journey. It is a, um, it's a journey in a race with many twists and turns, with many different chapters and many different seasons. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. There's a time to laugh and there's a time to cry. There are all these different events in life. How thankful we are as we are here tonight because we got guys in all kinds of places. We got guys that are pumped tonight because something they've been working on for weeks, maybe months, came through this week. And they are just so thankful and so relieved. We got other guys that are absolutely depressed because they just can't seem to catch a break. And if we walk long enough through life, we're going to experience both of those. We're going to experience health and we're going to experience sickness. It's just life. But we are so thankful tonight that the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> and, you, and you lead us, and you navigate us, and you walk us all the way through. Yes, you are our creator, but you are the one that enables us to finish. And as David said at the end of 23 of Psalm, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This race, this earth, is short term. It's just a hand breath. It's a wisp, and it's gone. And then, and then, well, we can't even imagine what's coming, what you have prepared. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has prepared for those who love him. 
Keep us going until the end, Lord. Help us to endure. Help us to build the muscle and the endurance we need to keep following you. We look forward to the finish line, which is to be absent from the body, is to be present with you. We don't fear death. You beat death. We're blessed men. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing this study on finishing strong, and tonight we're going to look at a king who is a king that is really a fascinating guy. We made the statement in here that in this race that we call the Christian life, you see a number of men in the scriptures who started strong, but it, it is the rare man who actually finishes strong. Because it's such a long race and it's such a hard race. Kind of our key verse has been Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Those are the men and some women of faith in Hebrews 11 who ran the race and finished. Um, They are the great cloud of witnesses referred to in Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run Two key words here. And let us run with endurance. The race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Uh, This race is hard, it's tough, it's long. It uh, is not for the faint of heart. Uh, That's why so many start strong, but uh, it is without question uh, the rare man who finishes strong. Now, the reason we're doing this study is that we all want to finish strong. We, we want to finish strong for the Lord. We want to finish strong for our families. We want to finish strong in our, in our convictions and in our passion. Uh, have you noticed it's, being, it, it, it's becoming more and more unpopular in this nation to follow Christ? In, in fact, if you actually believe what he said, um, you're kind of out of step. Uh, everything's been turned upside down. Everything's in chaos. We take what's good and we call that bad. We take what's bad, well, first of all, nothing's bad. That's a judgment, you see, and you're not supposed to judge. Those are the new rules. We take what is good and we call that bad, and we take what is bad and we call that good. This verse just popped into my mind, and I'd like, I've always um, been fascinated by, and let's just hope I can find it now that I brought it up. I think it's Proverbs 24, 24, because you see, as we're living in days like this, where everything is upside down and everything is topsy-turvy, there is a tremendous, tremendous pressure. Uh, and that's the word, is pressure, peer pressure. Peer pressure is not in just in high school. There is a peer pressure. I don't care what your age in life is. Most of your peers are going the, down the wrong path in the wrong direction, and you follow Christ, and you're standing out like a sore thumb, and you're not going to be popular. But you see, as we continue to go this way, there is this great temptation of compromise, to just get along. Proverbs 24, 24. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous. Peoples will curse him, nations will abhor him. abhor him. But to those who rebuke the wicked will be delight and a good blessing will come upon them. There are a lot of people in the church who don't believe that. I, I, I have been amazed over the years at some of the big, quote-unquote, evangelical, super conferences and the individuals who have been invited to speak to the body of Christ. I wouldn't want them near my family. I'm I'm astonished. I am stunned. And this has been going on for 20 years. Um, See, this this is why it's hard to finish strong. 
Because even in the church, if, if you are pursuing Christ and you take his word seriously, you're really kind of out of step, you see. Because there's stuff in here that Jesus said, and there's stuff in here that Jesus taught that really doesn't fly, especially in the culture, and so many in the church don't know the scriptures, don't spend time in the scriptures, they don't think scripturally, because all their information comes from other sources, yet they're in the church, they, they are, quite frankly, immature, yet, and, and this is just, in, in, in families, in big families, usually the immature outnumber the mature. Is that not true in your family? When your family gets together for Thanksgiving and Christmas? How many great-grandfathers are there? Great-grandfathers. Maybe none. There might be a great-grandma because the women tend to outlive the guys. That's always fascinated me. I don't, can't think about that too, too much, but <laughs> grandmas tend to, great-grandmas tend to outlive. So you might have great-grandma there. Maybe great-grandpa's not there. You see? But what about grandpa? You might have a grandpa. You might have two grandpas. You might have two grandmas. But you might have, then you got your kids, then you got grandkids, and you got all these little kids running around, maybe 8, 9, 10, 12 grandkids. That's great. The immature outnumber the mature. So in the family, you can't let the immature set the agenda for the family. The mature are called to lead. And in the church, it's the same thing. But in the church, which is a family, you've got so many immature who are more influenced by the teaching of the world than the teaching of Scripture, and they're kind of shocked if you say something that's biblical because they've never heard that before because they're not in the book. And you're going to get some heat and you're going to get some opposition. And it's becoming increasingly that way, is all I'm trying to say. So it's, it's, it's getting more difficult to finish strong. There are all these different ambushes. There are all these different... The enemy is subtle. Your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He's got all these different methods. He's got all these different strategies. Ephesians 6, be strong in the Lord. Uh, what is it, 6.10? Be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand... Uh, that you may be able to stand firm against the... The old King James says, the wiles of the devil... How many of you guys use the word wiles this week? <laughs> W-I-L-E-S. We don't use that word. That's an old King James, 16th century word. Uh, let's put it this way. Be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. And, you know, you may be thinking, devil? Come on. Well, he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. If Jesus believed in him, why wouldn't you believe him? You see. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, you don't know what it is. Let me tell you what it is. It's truth. That's what it is. Read Isaiah 14, read Ezekiel 28. The highest of the angels who in his heart decided he wanted to become like God. Let a rebellion in heaven was cast down. He, he's the God of this world, but not God with a capital G. Lowercase. He's not equal with God. And in his insanity, he is attempting to disrupt the plan of Almighty God and, God, and rob God of his glory. And one of the ways he wants to do that is to neutralize God's men that God has appointed to strategic roles of leadership in the home and in the church, which is why we're discussing the whole concept of finishing strong. See? There's this king in the Old Testament who's a fascinating guy, and, and he started strong, but he didn't finish strong. We're going to go to uh, 2 Chronicles uh, 26. His name is Uzziah. Uh, he, he was a very, very gifted man. Um, he had, uh, you know, it, 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 I'm sure you've taken some of these 
I know they don't like to call them personality tests, maybe strength tests, strength assessment, gifts assessments. And I, I remember when I was at down at Dallas Seminary enrolled in a program, and they had us take a nine different assessments. And I found them to be very, very helpful because uh, you kind of get a read on yourself, how you're wired, what you're good at, what you're not good at, you know. Um, and, and some guys, you know, some guys are visionaries. I mean, they can see, they can see out the horizon, and they see what's out there, and they can see what's coming. But not every guy who is a visionary. In fact, a lot of visionaries are just visionaries. What was unique about Uzziah is that he was a visionary, but he could also implement the steps that were needed to bring the vision into reality. Not every guy can do that, but Uzziah could do it. He also had administrative gifts. He had organizational gifts. Kind of a multifaceted guy, a multi-gifted guy. Really, really uh, highly, highly gifted. Uh, this, is, this is Uzziah. Uh, he was successful. He was very successful. Uh, and it ruined him. He's not a guy that went down morally. He was not a guy that went down because of uh, another woman. He was not a guy who went down sexually as... Uh, the enemy uses that strategy to bring down so many guys. That's not, that's not his story. He went down in another way. So uh, let's look at Second Chronicles 26. Some of you are already there. And all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the place of his father Amaziah. Um, Jump down to three. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. Um, look at verse four. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. So he had a great start. You see? Good start here. Followed the uh, footsteps of his, of his father, who showed him certain things that he implemented. Uh, verse 5, he continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, the prophet, who had understanding through the vision of God. Now watch this, and as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. Now I've marked that, ver that, that line. As long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. Because here's, here's something what the enemy does. Is that the enemy, very subtly, comes along to us in our lives, and he tries to divert us from seeking the Lord. And he doesn't do it in a flagrant way or a blatant way. If he wants to get you into sexual immorality, he probably won't have some good-looking young gal at your workplace walk into your office and shut the door and throw open her coat to find her stark naked and say, please, embrace me. That, he doesn't usually work like that. Because you'd be shocked, you'd be appalled. That's not going to... You know, and she's out of her cotton-picking mind. Th there's nothing enticing about something like that. So that's not how he does it. He's much more subtle. He kind of comes in the back door when our defenses are down and when it's like catching a fish, you see? So he's very subtle. And that phrase, as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. What the enemy does in very subtle, very small, very insignificant ways, he attempts to divert us. We're seeking the Lord. He attempts to distract us. He attempts to get our attention in another place, very subtly, not real blatant, just a distraction. Okay. Um, now, I want to stop there for a minute. Because it says, as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. As long as he sought the Lord, 
uh, he was successful. Uh, we're going to get into him in a little bit. I want to talk for a minute about success because we live in a culture that is intoxicated with success. Uh, I found this quote from Anthony Campolo years ago. He says, success is a shining city. It is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. We dream of it as children. We strive for it throughout our adult lives. And we suffer melancholy in old age if we have not reached it. For success is the place of happiness. And the anxieties we suffer at the thought of not arriving there gives us ulcers, heart attacks, and nervous disorders. If our reach exceeds our grasp and we fail to achieve what we want, life seems meaningless and we feel emotionally dead in our culture. Everybody wants to be successful. There is a right kind of success and there is a wrong kind of success. God has a definition of success and our culture, the world system, has a definition of success. And uh, a clear distinction needs to be made between the two, between God's definition of success and the world system's definition of success. Um, what the world says about success is absolutely contrary to what the Lord Jesus Christ had to say about success. Um, uh, John Johnson has taken this a little bit further, and he defines it this way. He says, success is attaining cultural goals that are sure to elevate one's perceived importance in that culture. So I, I think that's a good definition. Because whatever, you know, you go to different cultures, and they have different uh, trophies of success, don't they? If you've traveled at all, you know this is true. Uh, what is a really big deal in this culture is not any kind of deal at all in this culture. So success, Johnson says, is attaining cultural goals that are sure to elevate one's, watch this, perceived importance in that culture. Not your importance, your perceived importance. Uh, you can break, um, I, I think, success down e even further into at least three areas. Um, and if you experience an elevation, if you experience a uh, promotion, if you experience a, um, um, what's, uh, what's the word I'm at? If, if you experience any kind of uh, significant, I can't pull the word out, uh, growth, achievement, in these three areas, uh, culturally, you are perceived as successful. So if you get an elevation in three things, let me give them to you. Number one, if you experience an elevation, th this is how I look in our culture. If you experience an elevation in power, in power. You asked me a question a few weeks ago. Where does power play into this whole thing? It's a great question. Um, because you see, power is one of the root strategies of the enemy. Because we love power. Lord Acton had that famous line, all power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. We can, <laughs> quite frankly, we'd all like more power. And here's the deal. In our culture, as, um, as you ascend the ladder in whatever your chosen field is, as you get higher up the chain, uh, what is power? Power is, quite frankly, it's having commands obeyed and uh, wishes granted. The more power you have, the more commands and the more people are going to obey your commands, and the more wishes you have are going to be granted. Nice little breakdown, very simple, you see. Um, I remember studying uh, the attributes of God, and I think it was uh, in the book Knowing God. Uh, Daniel 2 says God has all wisdom and all power. But the statement that I read was that, and I love this, is that God has power over his power. I mean, I love that. And you see, we, we tend not to. As men, we have power, but we tend not to have power over our power. Our power has power over us. And we want it, 
and we desire it, but we have a real tough time handling it. Men are more powerful than women. When you play with your kids, when you play with your grandkids, you're teaching them things about masculinity and about power. Because you have power, but when you're playing with little children, you do have power over your power and you limit your power and you only use a small portion of your power as you have fun and wrestle and mess around with your boys and all that kind of stuff. You have power over your power. But see, we get in the corporate world and we get trying to get up the ladder and get this and this and this and what? what? We want more power. But power is a very, very dangerous thing. But when you have an elevation in power, you, you get that promotion, you go from middle management to executive VP, you see, your perceived importance has just gone up. I'll never forget Lee Iacocca. Uh, you remember when he was the latest, greatest thing? And uh, the father of the Mustang and all that whole thing, turned Chrysler around and wrote that big autobiography. I remember reading that on the plane to Boise, Idaho, or coming home from Boise. I just remember somewhere in my head, Boise, and that book. And uh, I remember him talking about it as a young engineer who was hired at Ford, he worked his tail off because he was trying to climb the ladder and in that culture at Ford on this, in this certain executive building, that their headquarters in Detroit, the goal was to get to a certain floor because if you got promoted, you would get an office in a certain floor, but it wasn't so much getting the office, it was they would give you a perk. And you know what the perk was? And he, he did a masterful job of setting it up because he, he laid out this perk like it was the most unbelievable thing in the world. And guys would go in early and stay late and neglect their kids and do all this and not see their wives. They were busting their tail to get this perk. And you're thinking, what the heck was this thing? You know what it was? It was a key to an executive washroom. <laughs> it was a stinking toilet. <laughs> Maybe the nicest toilet in America. But see, if you had that key and other guys didn't, your perceived importance. You ever checked into a hotel and you get in, you know, everybody's punching their elevator, and then some guy takes out this gold key and sticks it in the top and turns it and then pushes his floor. And nobody says anything. But you're thinking, who the heck is this yo yo? <laughs> you're not going to ask him because he's important. Or you think he is. We got all these little things we play with, don't we? So it's an elevation in power. Number two, success in our culture is an elevation in privilege. The higher up you go, the more special rights and the more special favors that you have. Uh, man, uh, this was 20 years ago. I, I was speaking at a conference in Orlando for the... Uh, uh, Christian Businessmen's Committee, their national co conference, at Disney World in that hotel with the swans in front. Swan Hotel? I can't remember. And uh, we had our kids, and it was like four or five days, and um, my friend Gary Rossberg, who lives in Des Moines, uh, whatever that year was, it's when those massive floods were all over Iowa, and Gary was working in relief uh, efforts with churches, and he, it was just nuts. He was just overwhelmed. So his two girls, Missy and Sarah, we took them with us, because they were friends with our kids. We took them to Orlando, so Gary and Barb could just have some time, and anyway. So we got, and we're late getting in because of storms, and we pull into this hotel about 2.30 in the morning. I walk in, the kid, every, all the kids are asleep, everybody's exhausted, and uh, I see Farrar, and the lady, she goes like this, she goes, hmm. You know, that's never a good sign at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> when they have this baffled look on their face, because they can't find your name. And she couldn't find her reservation. And she was real sweet and real nice, and after about 20 minutes, and, and they were absolutely sold out. The manager came in and said, we have one room left, and... Uh, Here's your gold key to the presidential suite. So we went to the presidential suite, stayed there four nights. 
That was really nice. <laughs> I'd never been in one of those before. But I'm going to tell you something. I enjoyed every minute in that presidential suite. And I would, I would do my sessions, and Mary and the kids were at Disney World running around from, you know, till early till late at night. I'd get back about 9.30, and they'd turn down the beds. And there were six beds in there. And they put mints on each pillow. It was about three pillows. That's about 18 mints. <laughs> I picked off every one of those mints. <laughs> every night, and those kids had no clue. You know, privileges are fun for a little bit of time. But if you're a Christian man, you really can't, you can't get used to it. Because the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Our job is to serve. That's our job as men. Yeah, we all, and we all like these little perks and privileges, and that's kind of fun. If you can get your points on vacation and stay, that's, that's fun stuff. But you can't get used to it, and you can't expect it, and you can't, like, you can't act like a 12-year-old at the ticket counter if your upgrade doesn't come through. You see? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, it would also be success would be an elevation in wealth. In, in finances, in property and you, you, you know the whole drill. And I'm not going to say much about that. I, I, I would just say this, but in our culture, when you have an elevation in these three things, when you have an elevation in wealth, in power, and privilege, you know what that adds up to? That equals status. Status. And your, watch this, your perceived importance goes up. Not your importance, your perceived importance. That's the world system. Now, we've we got to have discernment to see through this nonsense. You see? And the reason we've got to have discernment to see through it is that these things can very easily trip us up spiritually. Any of them can trip us up. Because, and you say, come on, not really. Oh yeah, really. Because they're so subtle. Are they not? You shall have, what's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. Is it not true that wealth can become a god? You've got to have money. You've got to pay the bills. You've got to provide for your family. But if you're not careful, it can become a god. Privilege can become a god. What was the other one? What was the first one? Power. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my, my gosh, can power ever become a God? You see, okay. These are spiritual issues, these are spiritual temptations. Now, I wanted to set that up because as we're going to look at Uzziah, we're going to see a guy who was eminently successful by any uh, stretch of your imagination, by, by any uh, evaluation, this guy was successful. So let's go back to Second Chronicles 26 and let's look at his list of accomplishments. Don't forget verse 5, as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. God is not against blessing his people. God gives his promises of favor and blessing. Not, but, but here's the deal. God does not want spoiled kids any more than you do. So God is careful and God is wise how he dispenses his gifts to us just as we are to be wise in how we dispense favors and privileges uh, to our kids. Most of us in this room have given our kids too much. I did, you probably did too. And maybe you, one kid can handle it and the next kid can't. You see? We, and we make mistakes with our kids and all this. God doesn't make mistakes with his children. He knows our hearts. He knows where we are. He knows our personalities. He knows our temperaments. He knows what will encourage us. He knows what will trip us. More on that in a minute. Let's go back to Uzziah, verse 6. Now, when he went up, this guy is going to have success after success after success. Much as we looked at David last week in uh, the first 10 chapters of uh, 2 Samuel, David never lost in battle. Uh, he unified the nation who had been split for years. He had the favor of God, he had the wisdom of God. 
This guy is tracking because he's seeking God with a whole heart. Same thing for Uzziah. He went out and warred against the Philistines and broke down the wall of Gath and the wall of Jabneh and the wall of Ashdod. That doesn't mean anything to us. It was huge to them. It's like saying, and Schwarzkopf took the armies and went right on into Baghdad, only they stopped short. See, we get that because we remember it. That was a significant campaign. This was a significant campaign where he was imminently successful. Okay? God helped them against the Philistines. Man, the Philistines were always battling the people of Israel and Judah. And then he lists the Arabians and the other tribes. You get in the Ammonites in verse 8. They also gave tribute to Uzziah. What does that mean? They paid money into the coffers of the nation of Judah. That's how it worked. Because he was able to dispense them and they paid him a fee. He took their taxes and it benefited, benefited the nation of Judah. Uh, look at 9. Um, well, uh, I can't miss 8. Uh, the Ammonites also gave tribute to Uzziah. His fame extended to the border of Egypt, for he became very strong. Very strong. Now, now watch the administrative abilities of this guy. He's not just a visionary. He's, not, he, he's, he's, he's a visionary. He's an implementer. He's an organizer. He's an administrator. Look at 9. Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the corner buttress and fortified them. Why? Well, he had all of his enemies handled, but he knew that, you know, things changed. And perhaps in his lifetime or in the lifetime of his son or his grandsons, things would change, other nations would rise up. And while he was able to do it and while he had the bucks, he was going to take care of the national defense. And he did it because he had vision. This guy was a, this guy was a leader. Uh, Ten. He built towers in the wilderness, he, he, on the outpost. He wanted to know what was going on outside in the rural areas. He wasn't going to wait till they showed up at the gates of Jerusalem. He built towers in the wilderness. He hewed many cisterns. What does that mean? Not a lot of rainfall in Israel. Uh, you can go to uh, the archaeological dig at, at Megiddo. You can go there. You can visit it. This, this tell. Uh, different cities over thousands of years have been built on top of one another. It's fascinating. Uh, one of the things you can do there is that you can go down the steps, the granite steps, into the cistern. Uh, there's not a lot of rainfall, so what they did at Megiddo and other places is that some guy took a hammer and some guy took a chisel in the solid granite and thought to himself, I think I will hewn a cistern. That takes vision. And it also takes implement, implementation because there are close to 300 granite steps that were carved out down in that solid rock. And in July when I was there, it was 110, 115, and as you descended those steps and as you descended the steps, you can see the chisel marks in the granite. How long did that take? But someone had vision and someone had stick to and they hewned a cistern at Megiddo that is there to this day. And as you go down those close to 300 steps, suddenly there is a coolness and there is a breeze and you can hear water. That rainfall has been, and I don't know how many millions of gallons are in that cistern. This guy did that all over the nation. You see? He had much livestock, both in the lowland and in the plain. He had plowmen and vine dressers in the hill country and the fertile fields. He loved the soil. He was thinking about his nation. Don't you think about feeding your family? You pick up some broccoli on the way home from work today? Go by the store, get a little produce? He thought about that because he had a whole nation to take care of. This is what leaders do. Moreover, look at 11. He had an army ready for battle, which entered combat by divisions, according to the number of their muster. Look at 12. Total number of the heads of households, the valiant warriors, is 2,600. Under the direction was an elite army. Under their direction was an elite army of 307,500. Who could wage war with great power? To help the king against the enemy. Moreover, here you go, Uzziah prepared for all the army. Shields, spears, helmets, body armor, bows, and sling stones. In Jerusalem he made engines of war invented by skillful men to be on the towers and on the corners for the purpose of shooting arrows and great storms. This guy flat out got things done 
by any measure of, of uh, by any standard of measurement, he was successful. And as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. Read the rest of verse 15. Hence his fame spread afar, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. Note the word until. Marvelously helped his whole life. That, that word until is significant. Something changed. He was marvelously helped until he was strong. He got so successful on every front that he had no weak areas. His strength was legendary. His fame spread afar, and that was his undoing. And we're going to see this in a minute. And here's the diagnosis I would like to make. You see, um, and we rarely think about this, but you see, the fact of the matter is, in the Christian life, there is a danger of too much success. There is a danger of too much prosperity. There is a, there is a danger of, of too much privilege. I'll never forget this. I, I was invited to speak in England eight years ago, nine years ago, and, and Lou Spencer was doing my, my booking for me, as he did for years, and uh, uh, this pastor, when I got to the airport, when, when I showed up and he had a couple guys to pick me up, they were, and, and Mary was with me and we're driving to the hotel, and um, this guy said to me, he said, I thought you would have a larger entourage. <laughs> I said, an entourage? He said, yes, I asked Mr. Spencer how many people travel with you. And he said, uh, normally, just it would be you and, and, and your wife. He said, I'm very surprised. It's just the two of you. I'm thinking to myself, who the heck is this guy hanging around? Why would you need an entourage? I'm just coming to speak. You can have too much success. You can have, you can have too much money. You can have too much prosperity. Let me show you something real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And see, here's what happened. We set these goals. We set these goals for us of prosperity. We set these goals for us, I want to achieve this, and I want to achieve this, and I want to achieve this, and I want to achieve this. And then what happens is, if we don't hit the goals, we get very depressed and we get very concerned because, you see, we wanted to, we wanted to accumulate more and to do better this year and all that. And we get upset and we're Christian men. And we rarely think about the fact it could be a mercy that God did not give you the goal that you wanted to get because it would have ruined you. We don't think like that. God warned them in Deuteronomy 6. That he's going to bless them in, in 6.10. When they go into the promised land, it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land. This is Deuteronomy 6.10. Which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build. He's going to just give it to them. And houses full of good things which you did not fill. You didn't go down to Ethan Allen and pick out the furniture with your wife. It was already furnished. Not only was the place unbelievable, it's furnished. Oh, oh, and cisterns which you did not dig. Well, that right there saves you sciatica. <laughs> Some other guy dug the cistern, got out there with his chisel. It's just sitting there with you. It's just full of water, thousands of gallons of water for you. So you're good there. When I give you hewn cisterns and vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied, watch 12, watch yourself, that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Watch it. Watch yourself. Watch your heart. Why? Because this is dangerous stuff, and few men can handle unbridled success. It's black ice on the road of life. You don't even see it. Now, is God good to us? Does God bless us? Absolutely. But in his wisdom, he gives and he, he takes away. Because he knows our hearts, he knows our temperaments, 
He knows what's best. He knows what would ruin us. He knows what would detour us. He, and see, all the time, this happens, and we, we, oftentimes we're disappointed. I find that fascinating. See, you, now, now, now we haven't seen the conclusion yet of the story. This guy was marvelously helped until he was strong. Now watch this. Here's what happened. Next verse. But when he became strong, his heart was so proud that he acted corruptly. See, in his heart, he could not handle the unbridled success. Couldn't handle it. It's too much for him. So what does he do? Um, I, I think when we talked a few weeks ago and the question was asked, what about power? And if I'm not mistaken, it was also, what about pride? Well, those are two huge root issues. Um, when he became strong, his heart was so proud, so arrogant, that he acted corruptly. Now watch this. And he was unfaithful to the Lord his God. Now watch this. For he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. Who is to, who is to burn incense before the Lord? Priest. Is he a priest? He's a king. Kings don't do that. Priests do that. But his heart became so proud that he knew no boundaries. Because of his unbridled success and his privileges, therefore he had unlimited power and rights in his own mind. In other words, the law didn't apply to him. This is the downfall of leaders. Then at, now watch this, this gets fascinating. Then Azariah the priest entered after him, and with him, 80 priests of the Lord, valiant men. They opposed Uzziah the king and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful and will have no honor from the Lord God. But Uzziah, with a censer in his hand, for burning incense, was repentant. That's not what it says. Now, if he had have been repentant, because our Lord God is merciful, and our Lord God is gracious, and he doesn't deal with us according to our sin or reward us according to our anger. If he had have been repentant, what does it mean to be repentant? It means you're walking in one direction, and by a change of mind, you make a U-turn and go the opposite direction. So he was in the temple burning incense with this scepter in his hand, and if he, when they confronted him, if instead of walking in further, if he had to listen to the rebuke and repented and turned and gotten out of there and obeyed what these guys said, this catastrophe that's going to occur would not have occurred. I don't believe because of the mercy of God. Now watch this. 19. Uzziah with a censer in his hand for burning incense was enraged. Do you have any idea who I am? This is what happens with power. This is what happens with privilege and too much wealth and too much stuff. And too many wishes granted. He was enraged, and watch this. Did he listen to the rebuke? No. While he was enraged with the priest, the leprosy broke out on his forehead. Before the priest in the house of the Lord, beside the altar of incense. Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous on his forehead, and they hurried him out of there. Watch this. And he himself also hastened to get out because the Lord had smitten him. Now he's listening. It never had to get to this point. 
King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death, and he lived in a separate house, being a leper. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord, and Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Twenty-three, Uzziah slept with his fathers. They buried him with his fathers in the field of the grave, which belonged to the king, whom they said he is a leper. As long as he sought the Lord, the Lord prospered him. But he got diverted, he got distracted. Powerful story. Um, What got this guy? Well, he was marvelously helped until he was strong. Uh, He got proud. He got proud. Verse 16, when he became strong, his heart was so proud. Let me give you two symptoms of pride. Number one is arrogance. Arrogance. Arrogance comes from an old word which means high. H-I-G-H. When you're arrogant, you think you are high. In fact, you think you are most high. When you read about Satan's rebellion in heaven against the Lord God Almighty, Satan's great sin was pride. You see, when, when you read the description in those, in those two passages, he wanted to be like the Most High. Here's the essence of pride. There's the right kind of pride. Yeah, there's, there's a pride in a, in a job well done. There's, there's pride in a, in a child when, when they learn a lesson and obey and you see them maturing. There's a, right kind of, there's a right kind of pride. There's an appropriate kind of pride. Um, but there's a wrong kind. And the wrong kind of pride is when you see the essence of pride and the most brilliant description of pride ever written was done by C.S. Lewis in the little booklet, Mere Christianity, in a little chapter called The Greatest Sin. Uh, You know what pride is? It's just wanting to be higher than anybody else. It's, it's, it's um, you want to best them. It's being stronger, it's being prettier, it's being um, more money, bigger house, mm, net worth. Mm, mm. It, it's, it's, you, you want to be higher. That's arrogance. Um, Romans 12.3 And again, guys, these are spiritual issues. These are spiritual traps. These are spiritual ambushes where the enemy seeks to bring us down as we're running the race following Christ. Look at, uh, let's let's pick up at, um, Let's read 1, 2, and 3. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, Romans 12, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. You know, to me, one of the verses that helps cut pride off at the knees is 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Flip over there just real quickly. When, when you start to get a little high, when you start to get a little haughty, when you hit your financial goals, by the way, on the way to 1 Corinthians 4, 7, don't ever forget Deuteronomy 8, 18. It is he who gives you the power to make wealth. So if you've accomplished it, where did you get it? That ties in with, where am I, 1 Corinthians 4, 7? Watch this. For who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? How many times have you seen some wide receiver? 
Catch a pass. You just want to slap the guy. And he really didn't catch it. Went through his hands and it lodged in his face mask. <laughs> and the sucker dropped the previous five. Because he didn't have any ability to concentrate and he's just trying to keep his looks. He didn't want to get hit. You, you know what I mean? And they prance around like, I mean, a bunch of, like a bunch of children. And he's walking around, all this stuff. By the way, what are the offensive linemen doing? Let's just break this down. This guy catches, actually went through his hand, lodged in his face mask, and he's in the end zone, so he gets to score. Walking around, glorifying himself. Well, if he had caught the ball, at least you could have said he had hand-eye coordination. Now, if you have hand-eye coordination, where did you get it? You got it from God. You say, man, I, you know what? I can't play ball to save my life. I've got horrible hand-eye community. I just can't do it. I'm, I'm a nerd. Oh, you're one of those rich guys that starts companies in Silicon <laughs> Valley, the way you all used to make fun of. You see? Everyone has gifts, but you don't have all the gifts. You see? But whatever gift you have, <laughs> you received it. So there's no room for pride or arrogance or haughtiness or anything else because whatever you have, he gave it to you. And you just say thank you. You just say thank you. That's it. Am I a blessed man or what? All glory to him. What do you have that you have not received? Man, that cuts this stuff off at the knees. I would say this. In order to finish strong, seek humility instead of success. Now, what does that mean? Let me say that again. To finish strong, seek humility instead of success. Um, now, listen, there, there's nothing wrong. And, and, and when we get into this whole issue of wealth and money and all that, how much is enough and where do you cross the line and when do you begin to love money, I don't know. But you got warnings in 1 Timothy 6 and other places in Scripture. We just read one in Deuteronomy 6. When you get the stuff, you, got, you really got to watch your heart because it can turn your heart very quickly, you see. Um, if you seek humility instead of success, go to Philippians 2. Let me show you this. And, and you know what? God's good to us, and God gives us, uh, God gives us gifts and skills so that we can make a living. Uh, we are to work, we are to provide. If a man doesn't provide for his own, he's worse than an unbeliever. I think that's 1 Timothy 5. Um, as, a, as a husband, as a male, it's your job to be a provider. Um, and, and sometimes, and, and we want to do well. Don't we want to do well in our work? Sure you do. But don't forget Colossians 3, which says, Whatever you do, do your work heartily. Not as unto men, but as unto the Lord Christ, for it's Christ whom you serve. So, whatever your vocation. Whatever skills, and, 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 and you're a blessed man, if your skill set, if you're able to take your skill set and turn that into a vocation, you're a very blessed man, you see? Because you're, you have certain gifts. If you're, if, you're a, if you're a people guy, you can read people. Uh, you're probably a good salesman because uh, that's a people game. You know, sales is relationship. Uh, if, if you're a numbers guy, you probably won't do well in sales. But numbers guys do really well in accounting and everyone, you know, engineering, everybody's different. But if you're working in your skill set and whatever you do, you do it unto the Lord and you want to do the best job that you can do, you, 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 you want to give it your all because you want to give glory to God. You, you want to do a job and you want to do it well and we teach our kids to do that. Okay, now if you do that kind of work, you're probably going to get recompensed and you might begin to have some money come in and some extra money. I mean, if you do, that's a blessing of God, okay? That's a great thing. Well, now is that a sin to have it? No, no, if you get your heart right, I mean, you just, you don't love the stuff, you love Him. Now I want to show you something, Philippians 2, that, that helps us handle when God brings prosperity and wealth into our lives, if indeed he brings it. Verse 3. 
Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Another word for empty conceit, the synonym is arrogance. A guy who is arrogant is just, he's conceited and he's empty because he doesn't acknowledge that whatever he has comes from God. Okay, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Uh, oh, and don't forget the word selfish. Because you see, here's the key. When God starts being good and giving you favor and, and some wealth comes in, well, what's the way of the world? Be selfish. Selfishness. You see? Now watch this. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. But with humility of mind, watch this. Regard one another as more important than yourself. That's exactly what Uzziah didn't do. He was most important than anyone else. No one's going to tell me what to do. Shoot, I'm going to go in there and I'm, hey, you know what? I'm a king. Well, listen, I'm a king and I got all these rights. I'm going in and I'm making a sacrifice. No, you're not. See, what he, what he missed was humility. It's not that you don't look. Notice that, that how careful this is. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Don't merely look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. God's not saying, forget about yourself and your family, and, you know, he's not saying that. God's not weird. He, do you look out for yourself and your family? Yeah, it's your job to provide and take care of them. So don't merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. In other words, that wealth and prosperity that he gives, don't be selfish with it, but be quick to give and help others with it. You getting this? If he's given it to you, be free with it. Be quick to help. Be, be quick to help the oppressed and the downtrodden and the widow and the orphan. Well, you know, I'm going to save it for a rainy day. Well, yeah, have a little put away for a rainy day. You know. But given it shall be given unto you. Oh, I can't give. Well, you're crazy not to give. Given it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaking together, running over. You see? Okay. You see how humility plays in with handling wealth? Look to use the wealth to help others. Okay, that's the point. Here's the second one. I, I guess what I'm saying is, make the money to serve others. Make the money to serve the kingdom. Have a nice home and, you know, thank God for the blessings. Uh, Psalm 127 and 128, in your home and you got your family and your kids and your wife around you and everything, it doesn't get any better than that. I don't care if you live in a mini mansion or in a mobile home. It doesn't get any better than that. You got good relationships, peaceful relationships. You're working out your stuff. You got your issues, you're praying for your kids, you're working your stuff out, everyone's got their stuff, everyone's got their junk, everyone's dysfunctional, but you're following Christ and you're functioning with his help. You follow me as I follow Christ. And you pray for those kids. Pray them through those rough spots. God got you through them, didn't he? He can get them through them. Okay, here's the second thing. Uh... In order to finish strong, seek contentment over status. Seek contentment over status. Philippians 4. This is really fascinating. Verse 10 of 4. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly. That now at last you have received, that you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I, now well, watch this, I have learned. I have learned. This doesn't come naturally. This is one of the last lessons in the Christian life, I think. It takes, this one takes a long time, this issue of contentment. I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. What are his circumstances at the moment? He's in jail. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. See, I've done both. In any and every circumstance, watch this. I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Watch this. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. 
Yeah, why? Because the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. You see, and, and God's monitoring my heart. And he's monitoring my circumstances. And he knows what is best for me. And he knows what I need. And he knows what I can handle. I don't need unbridled wealth. I don't need unbridled prosperity. Read Ecclesiastes 2. Everything that Solomon accumulated and did in his work in order to find happiness and in order to find peace of mind and contentment. In fact, even as I'm out of time, let's go to Ecclesiastes 2. I want to show you the falsity of the world system of success. If you're in Psalms, go to the right there. You're going to find, just before Isaiah, you'll find Ecclesiastes 2. Solomon says, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself. How do you enjoy yourself? By being successful. Behold, it, was too, it, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it's madness, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely, how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to under heaven in the few years of their lives. Now watch, watch how he gets into his work. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. Not a house, houses. I planted vineyards for myself. He didn't buy wine. He made wine. I made gardens and parks for myself. I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing tree. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of king and provinces. I provided for myself male and female singers. He, he, they, they didn't have CDs, so he just bought the group. <laughs> and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. All that, watch this. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. That's an amazing statement. Here was a guy that was drunk on success. All that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold from my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased with my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. So what's it like to have it all? He had it all. Uh, th this will kind of wrap this up. Look at verse 18. He had it all, look at verse 18. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. What's it like to have it all? He hated his life. So I'm not sure he really meant that. Well, look at verse 20. Therefore I completely despaired of all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. Really. And then what does he do in the rest of the book? He talks about the importance of quality relationships in life. You look at Ecclesiastes 3, verse 12. I know there's nothing better for them than to rejoice and do good in one's lifetime. Moreover, that every man who eats and drinks sees good in all his labor. It's the gift of God. Hmm. Look at 4 and 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. You've got to be in relationship. If either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. Woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Two lie down together, they keep warm. How can one be warm alone? It's all about the blessing of relationship. Look at uh, 5.18. Here's what I've seen to be good and fitting, to eat, to drink, and enjoy oneself and all one's labors in which he toils under the sun during the years of his life which God has given him. This is his reward. Look at 9.9. Nine. Enjoy life with the woman you love all the days of your fleeting life which he has given to you under the sun for this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. And I'd add to this Psalm 127 and 128. You get those relationships, you get those kids, you get those grandkids around the table and I'm going to tell you, it doesn't get any better than that and it's the blessing and favor of Almighty God. And you've got enough. And if you're a little short on the checking account, what does he say? He says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. If you're in a tough spot financially, it doesn't mean you'll always be there. It just means you're there now. 
because his delays are not his denials. Sometimes God delays a mercy because we're not ready for it yet. Don't lose heart. I, I, I'll just tell you this in, in, in finishing up. I have a good friend in, in another state, and um, this guy loves Christ. He, he's one of the best men I know. I respect him greatly. I've seen this guy grow in Christ. I've seen him go from an immature young man to a godly, mature, sober, steady pillar in his home and in his church and in his community. Done well in business. He's worked hard. He's paid attention to his sons. Um, paid attention to his marriage, fought off sexual temptation, as we all have to fight off. Um, Last year we were talking, and he had been working for years on a project, had made a proposal to a certain company, very large company, and uh, had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to get this in place, and I'm being vague on purpose. The, the, The time manpower, hired people. And after years of working and negotiation, he got word they were going to sign the deal. And then they decided to merge with another company. (laughs) And the number of guys came in and said, no. And the implications of not doing that deal, the people he had hired, what he had to build in order to make that happen? Well, he could only hang on for so long and, you know, well, give us 90 days. Well, we need another three months. We need another. And I talked with him several months ago. He goes, you know, Steve, let me tell you something. This thing's dead in the water. And uh, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to start laying people off and letting them go. This is going to be a real hit for us. And you know what was hard on him? He supports a lot of different ministries. That's what was really hard on him. He was afraid he was going to have to cut back seriously. But I remember him saying, this thing is dead. It's just absolutely dead. And last week, God resurrected it. And he's so exhausted, (laughs) he can't even enjoy it. No, he is. He he sent me an email this afternoon. He said, I am utterly and totally exhausted, but grateful. And you know why? Because um, he knows the scripture, when I am weak, then I am strong. And how are these funds going to be used? They they have a nice life. But primarily, they're going to be used to build the kingdom and to build people. And he's got his heart right and his relationships right. And he's worn out, but he wouldn't trade places with anybody. Don't lose heart. God knows when to give a good gift. His delays are not his denials. Just wait. He knows when to give you a mercy. He knows when to give you a well-timed. If it comes early, you may wind up like Uzziah, and it'll ruin you. Let's trust him. We do trust you, Father. Thank you for this lesson. Help us to uh, watch our hearts. Help us to be careful. Help us not to get high, but help us to bow low under your sovereignty. Let us learn these lessons, stay at our post, work on the relationships, and do our job right where we are to your glory. Bless us, we pray, as we follow you. Keep us from sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.